audience, welcome back to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. So I'm really excited for today's topic. As I travel around the internet on social media and various platforms, especially this year in different gardening circles, I've heard the topic of pollination come up multiple times. Uh, often it's someone posting a picture of a plant, they're concerned about it, and a lot of the comments or the people uh, giving advice will be like, oh, you don't have enough pollination, or it looks like it hasn't been pollinated, or et cetera. So I think this is a topic that we as homesteaders are vaguely familiar with. I know some people talk about the declining bee populations or why their squash plants aren't growing properly because they're not getting enough pollinators. But I really wanted to get to the heart of the issue today. What's going on exactly? Are we doing things on our homestead that could be contributing to the problem? And how can we encourage pollinators back onto our homesteads? So I am so excited to be joined by Kim Ironman today. She is an ecological landscape designer and environmental horticulturist. She's written books. This is her wheelhouse, and I am so excited for what she'll share. Welcome, Kim. Thank you so much, Jill. I appreciate you having me today. Yeah, I'm so excited for this um, because it is something I'm interested in, but I just don't have a lot of knowledge. So I'm hoping Mm -hmm. that'll be changed by the end of our conversation. We'll give you the short course today. Yeah, yeah. So (laughs) I I, I introduced you probably poorly. Could you give our audience just a little more background on who you are and why you're so passionate about this topic? Sure. So um, as you mentioned, I'm an ecological landscape designer using only native plants, native plants that are um, indigenous to where you are, regional to where you are. So you're in Wyoming, I'm in New York, I'm using New York-based plants, right, that are adapted here, appropriate for these conditions. I'm an environmental horticulturalist, again, focuses on native plants. And um, I do, I wear a lot of different hats. I uh, do ecological consulting work but based on uh, plant material. I do design of commercial, municipal, and residential um, properties. I'm based in uh, New York, Westchester County, New York, which is, um, you know, just north of Manhattan. I like to tell folks that I live 16 miles north of Grand Central Station. That'll give you a visual. Wow. Um, I would really like to be living in Wyoming where you are, but here I am. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Come on out. Um, I do a lot of teaching, which I really love. So folks, if you're interested in the topic of native plants, I teach at New York Botanical Garden, Brooklyn Botanic Garden, uh, the Native Plant Center here in New York, uh, Massachusetts Horticultural Society, and occasionally other places. Um, And a lot of these classes are online now. I mean, we have COVID to thank for that. I mean, not a lot good came out of COVID, but that was one thing. Better communication, being more embracing of, you know, other areas. Um, I also do a lot of public speaking nationwide on uh, many topics. Um, My company is called Eco Beneficial. You can visit my uh, website, ecobeneficial.com, and you'll see my speaking topics. You'll see where I'm going to be speaking, and you're going to see a lot of information on ecological gardening, um, videos and blog posts and, you know, interviews with other folks that really um, have a beat on this. And um, just before the uh, pandemic uh, really broke, my book came out, Perfect Time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not so much, but uh, The Pollinator Victory Garden, Win the War title. on Pollinator Decline with uh, Ecological Gardening. So I've got a whole section of my website that is devoted to the book that will give you some good core information, but also I publish um, regional plant lists. Um, so you can kind of refer to that. But I tell all my students, you know, all my audiences that um, don't be a slave to a list. Yeah, got to cross-reference and get information that's sound before you start uh, making plant selections. And um, what else did I do? I don't know. I'm sure I do some other things. I just can't think of them right now. (laughs) Well, that's a pretty impressive list, I'd say. You are a busy lady. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, so you mentioned, I think, some bits and pieces of it. But for those listening, because, you know, I have my homestead audience. We're pretty naturally minded for the most right. part. If someone's listening and going, OK, ecological gardening, how is that different than what I'm already doing on my on my property? Like, you know, I'm, I'm small gardening. I'm home gardening. What's how would you really differentiate? Or maybe it's the right. same thing. So, you know, I mean, some people may already be kind of getting it. A lot of people perhaps are not. So when we think about ecological gardening, ecological landscaping, we're thinking about supporting and enhancing um, the ecological health of where we are, our our little ecosystems, right? 
um, it's regional, uh, it's local. And, you know, if you're out in your garden on a day like today and you start seeing butterflies, you're going to notice like certain species are local to you right? Birds, the same thing. Um, insects, bees, and so on, kind of the same thing. So we're trying to not just support, but, you know, especially where I am in a very congested area, rebuild ecosystems in our own landscapes. And it sounds like a very heady idea. It's not that complicated. Honestly, um, it's, um, it's a matter of getting um, some knowledge about what would be growing around you had man never... <laughs> created, you know, a managed landscape where you are. Go to natural areas and see what is naturally occurring. Skip the invasive plants. They've been introduced by humans. Yeah. But we're, we're trying to, um, you know, really improve ecological health. That's, to me, the aesthetics are important with gardening and landscaping, but the, the primary goal for me is ecological. I'll be very candid about that. Yes. Um, so, you know, if you're using pesticides, um, you know, that's a real problem for things like pollinators. Um, if you're farming, um, you've got to make some tough decisions. Um, being an organic farmer is, uh, is tough, but it's yeah. doable. Um, thinking about um, not just where things like pollinators are feeding, but where are they living, creating habitat for pollinators? Most native bees nest in the ground. Do you have some bare areas in full sun um, in, um, you know, either bare or lightly vegetated soil where ground nesting bees can live? Do you have um, pithy plant stems that you leave standing or um, holes in old dead trees, tree snags, or um, even like uh, just openings in stone walls that you decide not to fill because, you know, cavity nesting bees might be using those as living space. So it's more than the plants that we put into the ground. It's thinking about providing nature with a place to live, a place to hide from predators, um, a place to feed safely, a water source, right? And the absence of pesticides. Um, that is just really critical. And, and not all pesticides are equivalent, of course. Yeah. Even, you know, but when we think about it, even organic pesticides can be quite harmful to sensitive creatures like bees. So we have to be really thoughtful before we pick up a spray bottle that we pick up at the local garden center or Home Depot or whatever and think, oh, it must be fine. They're selling it here. Well, you know, the truth is that for you or me, um, if we're just homeowners and we're not licensed professionals, it's easier for us to acquire pesticides and use them than it is for professional people who are doing this for a living. They have to be licensed. Mm. Isn't, isn't that a horrifying that's, thought? That's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and when you yeah. go to the garden store, you are assaulted. Like you can even smell it when you walk in, but oh, like oh, the horrible. aisles and aisles and aisles. Yeah, it's yeah. unreal how yeah. many there's there are to choose from. Overwhelming, yeah. actually. And just think that this stuff is benign. You're just kidding yourselves. Yes. <laughs> so yes. my book is uh, de dedicated to Rachel uh, Carson, um, yes. who a lot of you may have read uh, at some point in your life. Her book, Silent Spring, written in the early 60s, warning us about um, the the problems, um, the hazards with pesticides, but we're still doing it. You know, yes. where, where I live, certainly not my next door neighbors because they know better. Yep. <laughs> They've got me there. But you know, the number of, um, of pesticide signs that are required by, um, it's, I think it's state law. It may be municipal. I'm not sure, but you're required if you, you apply pesticides as a professional to leave these hard little yellow signs in the lawn saying pesticide has been applied here. And, you know, we just need to let go of this stuff. Our, our, you know, we're not perfect creatures and our landscapes don't have to be perfect either. I, yes. I think that's a big piece is just the shifting of the mindset um, right. that it doesn't have to look homogenous like everyone else in the United States. It no. can look different and it can be imperfect. I think that's such a, I don't know when Absolutely. in our history, we like, I know it was probably yep. in recent years, we got so obsessed with like the perfect lawn and the perfect garden. Like, it's just so it's so unrealistic and can be really damaging. Yeah. So Vol Voltaire is credited with a quote that apparently he ripped off from somebody else a hundred years before he lived. And his quote was perfect is the enemy of good. And I use yes. that all the time. You know, yes. we are not perfect and our landscapes don't have to be either. And in fact, if your landscape's too perfect, you're probably doing some things that are not helpful in terms of ecological health. Yes. Yes. So good. Um, so you, you mentioned so many points. I want to dig into each of these a little bit deeper because there's so much here. Um, 
I'd love to just start off just to give someone a big picture if they're like, okay, this is interesting. Like when, when, you know, what are the benefits to me? What are the benefits to my landscape? So if someone were to bring in more native species, like let's kind of focus on native species first. And I definitely want to get into pollinators. Um, Mm -hmm. So if someone were to stop buying as many plants from the garden store and bring in more native indigenous plants, what are the benefits they're going to see on their property? Or maybe they won't see them, but the benefits that will be happening. Oh, they'll see them. They'll see them. <laughs> Don't okay. worry. They, yeah, they will see them. Not, not to worry about that. So, um, if you live anywhere near a native plant nursery, that's where you go, right? So, the people, preferably the people, actually growing out their own plant material, and ask questions: Are you growing this stuff organically? You know, that's really important. But they're going to have a lot more knowledge than your run of the mill garden center. But there's so much great information online now, um, and you know, source out the credible resources, right? So most of those are going to be institutional. There are some commercial resources that are credible, but they're trying to sell you plants. So let's get real, right? So um, joining a native plant society where you are, if there is one, there'll be a lot of deep knowledge um, with those folks that you can um, benefit from. In fact, um, quite a few states, I don't know about Wyoming, but quite a few states, uh, they have a native plant society. They'll publish a list of regional species. So you can start to kind of take a deep dive and, and, you know, and look into this. But these are plants, you know, that were here before, you know, in, you know, before man was, right? Before we developed everything. They're locally adapted. They've co-evolved with the wildlife species around us. And that's really why I'm so focused on native plants, that co-evolutionary connection that can be so profound. So a lot of folks will know about the monarch and milkweed connection, right? So, you know, monarch, uh, monarch caterpillars are obligate feeders of um, plants in the Asclepias genus, milkweeds. So if they don't have milkweeds, they can't make it to the adult stage. But multiply that by the other 750 butterfly species in North America. They all have larval host plants that they've co-evolved with. Sometimes it's just a handful. Sometimes it's a a broader grouping, Um, but that's co-evolution for you. Um, So that's just one example. Um, About 25% to 30% of our native bee species in North America, we have a, we think we have about 4,000 species of native bees in North America. Uh, 10 of 10, 10% of those aren't even yet named, which is really horrifying. But anyway, we're, we're getting there. But um, 25 to 30% of our native bee species are specialists on the pollen of particular plants they've co-evolved with. There are a lot of these connections we just don't even know about. So I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, you know, for many years, we thought of butterflies as not being very efficient pollinators. Why? Well, they nectar from a distance, you know, they taste with their feet, they extend their long proboscis, their, their tongue, and they don't get all up into the pollen of a plant like a bumblebee does, right? Bumblebee's body is like really fuzzy, pollen gets all loaded all over it, even, you know, where it doesn't carry it, it might be completely covered in pollen by the time it finishes nectaring on a flower. And um, butterflies, not so much. So we've thought, mm, they're just not very efficient pollinators, they're not very effective, Lo and behold, this research study comes out of uh, North Carolina State in 2015. Um, and the, the subject of the research re- report was a rare case of wing, wing pollination. They looked at swallowtail butterflies and they realized that they have a behavior that's a little bit unusual for butterflies. When they nectar, they flap their wings. And they discerned, having made observations, um, and this obviously was in the Southeast, that um, swallowtail butterflies are the best pollinators of a native azalea called uh, Rhododendron calendulaceum, flame azalea. They never knew this until 2015. So I truly believe that if we look harder and harder and harder, we will find these co-evolutionary associations that we never knew existed. We just take them for granted. You know, sometimes folks will say to me, um, in fact, I had kind of a funny thing happened with a friend. She um, she said, my neighbor saw this great plant growing in the quote unquote wild. She took a photo and she said there were bees all over it. Where can she buy one? So I look at the photo and I realize this is one of our most pernicious non-native invasive plants on the East Coast <laughs> called mm-hmm. Japanese knotweed. I mean, it is 
pollen. And bees were using it for nectar. Well, guess what? There are lots of invasive plants that bees will use as a nectar source. Nectar is a sugar in the absence of more appropriate um, plants. But it doesn't make Japanese knotweed a good ecological choice. It disrupts ecosystems. It spreads like crazy. It replaces the native plants that should be there. So the short answer, what if you go, you know, to the trouble of investigating native plants and buying native plants? What are you going to see? You're going to see a lot of life in your landscape. Mm. So where I am, you can imagine, you know, really, really congested. I live on less than a fifth of an acre. Please shed tears for me because yes. it's tough when you're yes. a plant lover. <laughs> I bet. Yes. Um, and when I arrived in my house, uh, when we bought like 28 years ago, I guess it's been, um, you know, there was like lawn, a couple of Christmas trees that are plunked in the ground and a few non-native daylilies. That was about it. Doesn't look like that anymore. It looks like habitat. It looks like an ecosystem with beautiful flowers, with life, you know, just abundant life, birds and bees and butterflies, um, beneficial insects, you name it. I, you know, I love it when the possums come to visit the chipmunks. Yeah, we're, you know, we're trying to figure <laughs> a each rough other out. relationship. Yeah. With, with the chipmunks. <laughs> The, you know, I realized that, um, yeah, I got a little mini ecosystem here and there's a lot of life that just wasn't here at all um, before I planted. And and it's not just me. Every client that I work with, this is the goal is to really um, enhance their lives, not just their ecosystems. Yeah. So my greatest joy is when my clients send me uh, videos and photos of what's going on in the landscapes. And they're just, they're amazed. Like we just planted like, you know, I had a project that we planted in May and it already we have just an incredible abundance of life. So that's what you're going to see. Amazing. Do you see this, the species, the pollinators and the, the, the wildlife finding, like, let's say like in your case, I'm sure you're right. this oasis in a sea of non-native chemical sprayed mm -hmm. places. No. Are you finding that those species are able to find you pretty quickly or with people you work with, yeah. or can it take yeah, a while sometimes? Not it's actually shocking, mm. but you know, I wish it, it weren't just me. F fortunately, my next door neighbor on one side has um, allowed me to landscape for her and create a pollinator garden for her. So um, it's a whole different story over there. Now neighbors on the other side, I don't even want to get into it. Um, yeah. <laughs> they just, yeah. they just don't get it. They should yeah. be living in, in an urban environment without any kind of greenery because you know, yes. lawn doesn't cut it. I call lawn the green desert. It's an yes. ecological wasteland. Yes. So it's way better if you can connect landscapes and defragment habitat way better. You bump up the resources geometrically when you connect landscapes. And so to that end, there's this wonderful movement um, on the East Coast called the Pollinator Pathway Movement. And I hope it'll kind of work its way <laughs> further and further west. But there are other organizations like Bee City USA that are national, actually North American and so on. But the Pollinator Pathway um, is all volunteer created, volunteer run, and um, providing amazing information on their website about you know, how to build your pollinator garden. I think they're, they're now in like at least 14 states, which is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. So not only how to do this, um, and they, you know, they give you some basics, you know, some basic information, but if you get uh, the right plants, the right habitat, um, you are then able to quote unquote, get on the pollinator pathway and put a sign in your yard. I'm on the pollinator pathway. And this has been an infectious movement that's probably made more change, you know, in my point of view, than anything that I've seen in the last 30 years. Just, you know, people are ramped up, they're excited, they're talking about it, they're making change, they put the signs out, um, and neighbors start to ask, well, what's going on here? Why are you doing this? And um, there's a good story to tell. Yeah. I love when the social contagions happen for good. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the questions I love to ask about various topics on this show is I love to know kind of how we got to where we are today, because I think it's fascinating because it usually has happened in the last hundred years or so. It's usually tied mm -hmm. to either the end of World War II or the Industrial Revolution when we start to see <laughs> these shifts. And I'm curious if you, if you know the history of kind of when did we start want, needing lawns and needing to have these homogenous plants and thinking that certain plants were landscape worthy and certain ones were not. Do you have any um, feel thinking on that where we, that shifted? Thinking that we needed, Thinking right? that thinking we needed, that. yes. Thinking, yeah, not, yes, <laughs> yes. Not, not reality, but thinking so, that's so important. 
So a couple things, um, you know, and you probably know this based on where you're located, right? So, you know, Native Americans were managing landscapes. Yes. Right. Yes. I mean, yes. you know, so we, you know, the colonists weren't the first ones to take that approach, but of course the Native Americans had a much greater appreciation and connection to nature right. than the colonists did. But, you know, in the um, 1600s, uh, primarily when the colonists started to, to come over, um, you know, what did they bring with them? Well, European honeybees, not native. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a lot of medicinal plants that they knew from, um, you know, over there in Europe. Uh, a lot of them are today's weeds like mugwort, horrible, horrible, mm -hmm. pernicious weed here on the East Coast. Um, and, um, you know, times are kind of scary because, you know, here you are out, out in the, you know, in the landscape without protection, you start clearing, <laughs> you start clear cutting areas. Um, and then you got to make your farm. So you clear cut even more areas. And, you know, it became a way to kind of control nature and feel more secure and so on. So it started kind of a long time ago, but you know, um, for us in more modern times, having a lawn w was kind of a status thing, right? Yeah. So in, in, in the, in the typical English countryside manner, you know, they would use sheep to, you know, munch down the grass or, you know, when they got a little bit more sophisticated, they brought in some manual equipment to mow down the grass around the manor house. It was controlling nature, right? And um, the aesthetic back then was it was very controlled immediately around the home um, and then got kind of wilder and wilder as you moved away from the home. And some of us do that today if you have enough land. The problem is most of us don't have enough land to, to even do that. And so it kind of became a status symbol to have a lawn. Well, truth be told, um, the lawn grasses that are in a typical um, lawn um, are not native. There might be one exception like red fescue. They're just, they're not native species. They're not adapted to our conditions. They don't like it here. They have to be managed intensively. I call um, lawn, um, you know, kind of like a needy baby. It's always hungry. It's always thirsty. It always needs attention. Sorry, babies. Yes, that's true. <laughs> no offense, yeah. babies. Yeah. But, you know, that's what lawns are like. If you don't water them, if you don't fertilize them, if you, you know, don't aerate them and so on, um, mow them constantly, um, it doesn't really work out so well. So this is the opposite of um, being environmentally conscious. So I, I truly think that, uh, that a cultural change in terms of how we view turf um, is going to be uh, a trigger point in terms of changing the way that we landscape. I have no lawn. When I got here in my little landscape, there's plenty of it. There's none. Um, I went to see a client um, day before yesterday and I drove up. I'm like, I know which purse, which house this is. <laughs> there's no lawn. <laughs> yep. I, I already, I was like, wow. Um, and I have that discussion with clients all the time, you know, because I get, you know, now um, we have a lot of uh, younger folks in their 30s and their 40s who have moved out of urban centers. They're moving into their first home. They have green values, but they don't know a darn thing about how to deal with the landscape. And so we have this discussion. How much lawn are you going to let me get rid of? Yeah. If we don't take the whole thing because maybe your neighbors are going to give you, you know, the side eye. <laughs> like, what are you doing? So we negotiate this and sometimes it's just keeping a, you know, a wide strip as a pathway of lawn mm. to show intent. And that, that goes a long way to get, getting people on board, showing intention. This is a cared for landscape that is intentionally planted this way, intentionally managed this way. We haven't just lost our marbles and, you know, let the turf grass grow up and uh, be unmanaged. And, and some people ask me, well, if I just let my lawn grass grow, isn't that like a meadow? No, because what's in there? Yeah. Non-native grass species yep. and mostly European weeds. Yes. That does not make a meadow. So um, sorry, folks, if you're, if you're really embracing the no mow may, I say this is weak tea, as the Brits would say. Mm. This is not sufficient. Not doing anything <laughs> yes. isn't good enough in our challenged environment. I want to see no lawn June. That's what yeah. I'm going for. Yeah. Right. So we've really got to stand up and be proactive and realize we're in a situation. Maybe we individually didn't create it, but we're living it and we're perpetuating it, but we can change it. It just takes the will to do it. Yes. I love that. Yeah. That mindset shift is everything. Okay. So selfishly now I have to I have a confession and a personal question. <laughs> 
I, we, we have 60 acres, a little over 60 acres. And most of it's prairie grass, right? Just pasture and just whatever native grass is growing. But I do have a little bit of lawn around my house because, yeah. you know, my husband's like, we need lawn. We have little kids. Well, we have little, littler kids, but right. they, he's like, they so, need to play. But yeah. it, it bothers me. I don't, and we, we put in grass, we planted grass. It's like hardier. It's drought, more drought resistant. It's like right, right, tougher, right. right? It's still, I, I guarantee it's not native, but it still kind of bothers me. We're mowing it. It's, I mean, it's pretty, I guess, but, but my fear is we live in a drought prone environment. We have long winters. I'm like, I'm afraid if I landscape it, it's going to be super high maintenance and look really cruddy eight months out of the year. So if you have any <laughs> advice for me. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a reality to how we live, right? So I, my suggestion is you keep the lawn you really use. You lose okay. the rest and plant it with natives. Yes. So make that judgment. Um, don't be like the client I had years ago in Connecticut who had 10 acres of lawn and never went outdoors. Oh, yeah, no. No. This is like lunacy, right? Yes. <laughs> right? So keep what you really use, manage it organically. Okay. Um, and that's that's the story. So what grass you use? Well, if you can find a native grass, like, you know, um, in parts of the Midwest, uh, buffalo grass makes a really good yes. um, lawn replacement. Where I am, it's just too wet and humid for that to be fully successful. So on the East Coast, we really don't have a direct equivalent to turf grass that's native it just doesn't really, nothing really functions that way, but you might have an option. Um, so obviously a, um, you know, a low grass that you don't have to constantly mow would be, you know, a, a benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And is this like, I'm just picturing, like I picture, I, I fantasize someday my kids are gone. I have more time and they're not, you know, not running around <laughs> barefoot as much like taking that lawn area and, and, and bringing more native plants in, making more, yeah. Does it always have to be like landscape? Because I, I worry about my ability because I have two large vegetable gardens. Like, could I manage right. two large gardens plus an intricate landscape that needs some maintenance, right? To keep it looking yeah. non-raggy. Um, or could is there ways to plant those areas with just more of like a meadowy? Like, how would you how would you put a meadow in your sure. front lawn? Is that well, depend, depends on the side. So I'm going to, because you can't see it. So there's okay. my book. Yes. Okay? And I've got some projects in here. Let's see, okay. I'm going the right way, right? Yes, I can see it. Yep. One of them is creating pollinator islands within mm. your lawn. Okay. Okay. Right? So we could so start with that. Kind yeah. of asymmetrical. If, that's, if that works for you, just start smallish. Yes. Remember, you know, that we need to feed a lot of different pollinators at a lot of different times, you know, from early spring through late fall, depending on where you live. Okay. You know, you may live in an area that never gets cool, but so we need to have enough native species to feed the pollinators that are emerging at different times of year that have different preferences in terms of food from flowers and uh, obviously the larval host plant equation. So we need to have enough different species that's that I call the diversity part, yes. Yes. but we also have to have a sufficiency of any given species we have to have big enough targets so pollinators can find them. Okay. So the best research I've seen is out of the um, University of California, Berkeley Bee Lab. And they found that a one square meter of a single plant species is an ideal target for most bees. Mm, okay. So, so think, I call this achieving floral balance, the, the balance between plant diversity and plant sufficiency. That means your pollinator island, if you're just counting on one, has got to really be able to accommodate that kind of floral balance. But you could have multiple pollinator islands. Okay. Um, one thing to think about, and I don't, I don't know how people are landscaping immediately around their house where you are, but where I am, we see the endless green meatballs splat up against the house, <laughs> like little yeah. green soldiers, yes. right? Yeah. And, you know, in plant beds that are maybe three to feet, four feet wide, if that. Who wrote that rule? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so start to bring the plant bed forward, plant more deeply with layers. You're already enhancing ecosystem health simply by doing that and bring more species, you know, into your habitat. Okay. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways that we can, you know, approach this. If you've got, you've got 60 acres, you've got room for native prairies. You, yes. I don't know what's growing in your prairies, yeah. but 
probably not a bad idea to figure out what is in there now and what should be in there and start introducing some things that perhaps you don't have. But that's that's a huge plus to have that much grassland. You know, we've got um, a lot of grassland birds that are in big, big, big trouble because they've lost habitat. So it's just not like big tracts of land that are owned by corporations. It's folks like, you know, like you, like farmers yes. and, and so on that can start to support endangered species and grassland birds are in trouble. Yes. So think about, you know, preserving some of that habitat for them, um, you know, in a really significant way. It, it all matters. I mean, I feel like if I can do what I do in my little tiny landscape, boy, the sky is the limit for so many people in terms of, you know, making change and improving ecological health. I'm doing it right here. Yes. And I love talking to people in your, where you, like, in your living situation, because, you know, a lot of my audience and myself included, we have acres and acres. And I think we get, right. I get sloppy with it sometimes. And when I see someone on like you on a fifth of an acre and you're doing all this, I'm like, Oh, I need to step up my game. Like I could be doing so much more. So I think it's really inspiring. Don't get overwhelmed. <clears throat> and this is really easy to do. Even in small landscapes, you, you just look around and you go, Oh my gosh, where am I going to start? <clears throat> yes. So my suggestion is start on the small side, start in an area that's highly visible. If you love to cook, you're looking at your kitchen window. Yeah. Hey, Make sure where you're landscaping, you can see it. Someplace you're spending a lot of time. Um, if you've got an outside area where you're grilling or whatever with the kids, make sure you got some uh, native landscape there that you can really enjoy and appreciate all the, the wildlife coming in. So, you know, make it rewarding for you and just start small. Um, we all make mistakes in landscaping, yeah. you know, so don't be afraid to make a mistake. Um, that's how we learn the best. Just start doing it is kind of the simple answer. And you'll learn. I learn all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Journey. <laughs> and you mentioned you have um, native plant or regional plant lists on your website and also in the book, correct? If people want to yeah, look so for the region. I've got the the regional plant lists are, I, I have plant lists on my in my book but they didn't let me publish everything in the book. So it's supplemented by my website um, okay. information. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I've been steadily learning more about that in, in recent years, but I, I definitely want to dig in deeper. So I'll be checking that out. Um, mm -hmm. My husband recently told me, I just assumed, you know, we have pasture that's been pasture for, for his, forever. It's never been farmed. Right. And I just right. assumed I'm like, Oh, I have native prairie grass. And my husband, we were driving to town one day. He's like, well, you know, all the, this is like grass that was planted by settlers a hundred years ago. And I was right. like, what? He's like, it's crested it's wheatgrass. It's not the actual prairie grass. And I was like instantly yeah. mad. And he's like, why are you mad at me? I'm like, I'm not mad at you. I'm just really mad that I thought it was like yeah. the right grass. And now I need to like figure out, okay, how do I bring the actual native grass in? So, right. Yeah. Lots and of so, do. you know, there are some native grasses that will serve as forage. This is not my, you know, my wheelhouse to be mm -hmm. honest. So I, can, I only know a little bit about this, but that's something to look into. But you know, it's, it's kind of like long grass. Most of the forage grasses were non-native and yeah. um, some of them have become quite problematic, yeah. um, unfortunately. So, you know, kind of understanding what you have is the first start and um, dealing with the invasive species is such an important thing. Yes. Hopefully you don't have as many as we do. We have some, but yeah, not, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. I know we do have some. And then, you know, the, the county comes around and is spring and I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. don't, don't like the, sp the spring either. So, um, yeah. So um, I will point out if, um, if your listeners don't know about the Xerces Society is a fantastic organization. It's a nonprofit and it's spelled X E R C E S Xerces Society. Okay. Join them, support them. They are um, like the Audubon Society, but for invertebrate species. Okay. They have a lot of information on their website. They have a lot of research and they've got a really robust program helping farmers improve the environment through okay. different practices. So that's just a really excellent resource if, you know, if you're running a farm to kind of get a handle on this. They're, they're working all over the country. Awesome. We will drop a link to them in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, that's awesome. Good resource. So Okay. So I'd love to shift over. We talked native species. I'd love to shift into pollinators a little bit more. Um, okay. I think most people, I, I love, I think there's more awareness about the decline and especially bees. I hear people chatter about that, but I'd love mm -hmm. to really understand why that's mm -hmm. happening. And I know I've heard people kind of blame it on lots of things and lots of native species, more pesticide use. Do you, is there one big factor or do you feel like it's like all of the above? 
no, it's a combination of factors. Okay. Um, without a doubt. I think probably, well, I mean, I think of three things um, as being primary, right? So loss of habitat, we're just mm -hmm. developing everything under the sun. And when we develop landscapes, we don't think about um, creating, um, you know, backyard habitat, front yard habitat. So that's, that's just a lost opportunity. Um, the rampant use of pesticides, not just in agriculture, but in residential landscapes. I mean, it is everywhere. So um, learning about regenerative farming, <laughs> yes. um, and learning about an ecological way to manage um, a farm um, for farmers is um, really, really important because you've got the big tracts of land. You've got the opportunities to have, you know, what used to be the case um, hedgerows that were native, uh, native plants that were allowed to come into the farms instead of just, you know, cutting everything back. And, um, you know, the milkweeds <laughs> that used to be there are no longer there. So when the monarchs are migrating, it's just not there anymore. Um, using um, genetically modified seed. I mean, let's get real. Um, Roundup ready crops. Just yeah. we can't be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can't be, you know, planting that stuff and then spraying everything and killing everything that's out there. Um, it's just, you know, we just can't afford to, uh, you know, to do that um, anymore. Um, so, you know, it, it takes um, that and so pesticide use development and, um, and the, the use for decades and decades and decades of primarily non-native species. That's a big yes. problem. And okay. I, I see that everywhere. I don't know. We, you know, we're always fascinated by what we don't have. And we're, you know, Americans aren't alone in that. You know, we go over to another country as we did in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We see something cool. We bring it back. Well, you know, for us, that Japanese barbary is not working out so well. It is now the main component of our forest understory. That burning bush from Asia, not working out so well. That you know, yeah. Japanese honeysuckle and, I mean, autumn olive and swallow wart. I mean, there's so, porcelain berry. I mean, there's so many of these plants that we introduced intentionally, which is crazy because we really didn't have that, that knowledge of ecology back then. Some of these things came in unintentionally too. Um, but, um, you know, now that we kind of know it, you know, let's, let's get real. Let's take a look at our invasive species list for our state and then take a look at the, at the adjacent states as well. What are some of the problem species? Get them out of there. Yeah. I, got, I have no patience for that. When a client says, oh, well, I really want to keep the Rose of Sharon. It's not hurting anything. Well, it's reseeing prolifically, not only in your landscape, you know, but your neighbor's landscape and so on, replacing things that should be there. It's got to go out. I'm, I'm really ruthless about this. Yeah. I don't negotiate about invasive plants with clients. Yeah. So getting, getting a handle on that is going to be really important in terms of tipping the balance to a native environment that's more ecologically supportive. So, you know, the pesticide use, um, I don't know. That's just something that most homeowners don't ever have to touch. A pest, I've never used a pesticide in yeah. 20 years of my landscape. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. So, it is a combination of things. And of course, you know, there are new viruses and there are, you know, new pest insects that actually uh, plague, you know, things like bees and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on, um, but we can make a difference. And I think, you know, when people just read the headlines and they get stressed out and they read about climate change and environmental disaster, you just feel exhausted, don't you? Yeah. Don't feel exhausted, get motivated. Yep. get out there and do something about it. And then you, you really feel good. I mean, it's, it's one of the few things that we can do in our lives that we can make a profound positive impact. I wish there were more opportunities in life to do that, but this yes. is one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And those little steps do add up, I, I think in so many areas. Yeah. 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 So I have a lot of home gardeners listening to this. So if can, or how do I phrase this? Can you maybe explain some of the symptoms they may be seeing in their vegetable gardens or their home gardens um, if they that could be contributed to a lack of pollinator, pollinators on their property? Is there anything they should be watching for? Maybe I'm just hoping you'll, if you could say something that might trigger them to go, oh, that's why I had trouble with that last year. Is there anything well, they can watch for? Sure. So, you know, they're 
there's pollinator activity and of course there's, you know, pest and disease issues. So these are kind of, you know, yeah. different things. Um, sometimes they overlap, but, um, you know, I, I suggest to homeowners that they really seriously uh, consider ramping up the number of beneficial insects in their landscape by planting the native plants that those insects like. Mm -hmm. the, the predators and the parasitoids of pests that plague our gardens. So it sounds really complex. It's really not. We start planting the plants that they really like, and they typically tend to be small flowered native plants. Mm -hmm. A lot of these um, uh, predators and parasitoids, um, you know, well, like lady beetles, like everybody knows a lady beetle, right? Yeah. So they're seeking out uh, mostly pollen, but also some nectar. They're feeding on that and they're looking for flowers that are accessible to them that are in bloom at the time that they're active and so on. So kind of letting go of the pesticide and ramping up um, the abundance of beneficial insects and don't overthink it. Just get the plants in yes. <laughs> with, yes. a, with a sequence of bloom throughout the entire uh, active growing season, wherever it is that you are. So for me, that, that starts in March and it goes all the way through late fall in terms of having a succession of bloom of plants that support beneficial insects, um, including, you know, these are natural enemies that we're talking about, but also pollinators and so on. So a healthy landscape is full of insects. Okay. What yeah. are some other yeah. be beneficial insects to be considering besides lady beetles? I think that's the most yeah. common. What lace are some wings, other ones? Yeah. Lace wings um, are, are one. Um, depending on where you live, you may have praying mantids that are native, but there are a lot of introduced ones as well. So you have to be careful about that. Um, and um, show some love for our native wasps. We have some mm. fantastic predatory and parasitoid, meaning they parasitize other insects, wasps that are native, that keep the balance of nature kind of in check in terms of insects. So, you know, some research I've come across uh, says that somewhere between 90 and 95% of the insects in an average home landscape are either beneficial or benign. Now, we all know when we get bad actors, it can be brutal, right? Yes. Um, right now um, on the East Coast, we're just getting blasted with spotted lantern flies. I hope they don't make it your way. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, I'm like a bloodhound. I see one of these flying outside. I am running. I don't care what I'm doing. I'm running out the door to try to kill it. Mm. Um, they're really, really harmful, not only to agriculture, but they're piercing, sucking insects that are leaf hoppers. And for the first time um, since I've lived in my house, which is quite a long time, I am seeing a disease called aster yellows that I guarantee you is being transmitted by spotted lanternflies. The leaf mm. hoppers transmit this. It's a phytoplasma. Um, as they're feeding, they contaminate the plant with this phytoplasma. And then all of a sudden, you're, you know, your echinacea purpurea, your coneflower, instead of looking normal, they're completely green from beginning to end and twisted. And I mean, and it affects a lot of plants. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when when they're bad actors, it can be really bad. <laughs> and I'm assuming those but, are non-native to you. Do those come from? Oh, no, 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 no. Introduced, another introduced yeah. species. Yeah. And they're, I mean, it's really scary. I, you know, as I said, I teach at New York Botanical Garden and Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And when I am in those gardens, I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's so many yeah. of these things all over the plants. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we need to do what we can do. If you walk by a spotted lanternfly, you don't squish it. You're not doing your civic duty. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> We had um, <clears throat> emerald ash borers come through a couple oh, of years yeah. ago and just yeah. devastated so many trees Absolutely. and stuff. And I was so mad. Absolutely. I'm like, you don't belong here. But yeah, I didn't even know what was happening until everything started dying and it was just, it was devastating. Ash trees, you know, there's, there's some hope. We're not there yet. There's some hope, but it's, um, you know, I remember hearing a scientist, his, his like main focus for his career was ash trees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's like the thing that I've been spending all of these years studying may be no longer existing by the time oh. I die. How, how depressing is that? So depressing. So be really careful, you know, about like bringing in materials from other States, yeah. you know, like, you know, firewood, <laughs> a great way to bring in yeah. insects that don't belong where you are. And f for heaven's sakes, do not purchase um, beneficial insects like lady beetles through the mail, because you may be unwittingly introducing a new pest or disease mm. that comes in with those. Yeah. So we, what we do is we plant to attract. 
Okay. That's what we do instead. Yep. That's great advice. Because it is the the mail order bugs are real appealing when you're in the middle of a pest problem. <laughs> like it's oh like, yeah, it's so easy oh, to yeah. grab it's a like, bag from yeah, like, maybe yeah. creating another problem. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, right. very good point. Very good point. Um, what are some of the other pollinators besides bees, which is and butterflies? What are some other right. ones you could be helping bring in? Yeah, so um, we don't necessarily think of them when pollinators come to mind, but we have a lot of flies that provide pollination services, Okay, which is um, kind of amazing. Um, some of them mimic bees or wasps. They look very much the same, but they only have one pair of wings. So you can okay. kind of tell the difference if they sit still, right? But we have some really like cool um, flies like bee flies that I, I'm not sure even how to describe. They're so incredibly unusual. Um, and there are lots of different pollinating flies. Again, not all flies, flies pollinate, but there are quite a few that do. Yeah. Beetles um, mm. are an enormous group of insects, um, largest group of insects on earth. Not all of them are pollinators, but there are a lot that are. And they primarily are looking for pollen and to some degree flower parts they will feed on. So that's another category of pollinators. Um, we've talked about butterflies a bit, 750 species or so in North America, but we almost forget the moths. I just want to ask you about moths. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we see some daytime fly moths and they're like, oh, look, you know, hummingbird moths, you know, but we forget about all those that are nocturnal feeders. And um, it's thought that in North America, we have somewhere between 11,000 and 12,000 species of moths. Mm. Compare that to 750 species of butterflies. So way, way, wow. way more moss species. Okay. And they're the silent pollinators that we're not seeing. <laughs> yes. um, but they're really, really important. And there's research. It's just starting to heat up now. Some research that's coming out um, about the contribution that moths make to pollination of things like blueberries, you know, and okay. so on. So I think we're going to see more and more of that research now. You know, for moths and butterflies, we also have to have those larval host plants in our landscape. Many of them are woody species, trees, okay. shrubs, and vines, but many, many are um, perennial, herbaceous perennials that are flowering or even non-flowering. A lot of our native grasses are larval host plants for uh, skipper butterflies, which kind of look moth-like. Okay. So getting those larval host plants in is really important. Um, it's just having a floral buffet isn't enough. Okay. You got to feed the caterpillars. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, there are some species of moths that um, only feed in the caterpillar stage. They never develop mouth parts sufficient to eat as adults. So like oh. some of the really charismatic moths, like sphinx moths, you know, um, you know, here we have this amazing, you probably have it there too, the Cecropia moth. It's incredible, incredible charismatic moth. They only feed as caterpillars. Okay. So maybe showing some moths some love would be, you know, a good idea, yeah. right? <laughs> now, okay, we and, uh, oh, didn't mean to interrupt. Go yeah. ahead. Sure. No, go go right ahead. So we have an outbreak of moths. We call, they're also we also call them Miller moths sometimes in okay. you know early summer, and <clears throat> it can be like almost a horror movie proportions. <laughs> like you'll yeah, go yeah, outside yeah. and like you can have to keep your mouth closed if you walk by certain bushes because they will swarm you. Luck. <laughs> yeah. Are those poll? Because yeah. we all we all dread moth season here. Are those right. pollinators or all? Are, are... I don't. I don't know that species. Okay. I'd have to check the species scientific name and and take a look at it. But you know, you can take a look and see that they may sure. be introduced or not. I mean. You know, we have um, native insects that can be problematic at certain times, mm -hmm. um, with climate change rearing its ugly head. We're going to have more kind of weird events, I'm afraid. Um, but um, you got to kind of check it out, right? Yeah. Um, and the other category to consider, and I kind of alluded to this, are, um, are wasps, uh, specifically as pollinators, predatory wasps. Okay. Um, our native ones tend to be solitary. They're, they're not the ones that are living in big nests and so on. Um, and they're really good predators on a lot of uh, pests that we don't want. Um, they've got shorter length tongues than um, some other pollinators, like, you know, long tongue bees, for example, would be a big difference. Uh, between a wasp and a long tongue bee, like a bumblebee. Mm -hmm. So they need um, flowers that are a little bit more accessible for okay. their short mouth parts. And they particularly like white flowers. Mm. So for us, these are mountain mints. I'm sure you got pycnanthemum species where you are, but Achillea, yarrow, and there are yeah. quite a few yeah. others that are really moth, uh, excuse me, really uh, wasp friendly. 
And so, you know, what I'm talking about here um, in terms of the pollinators and the flowers that they're seeking out, we call these uh, pollination syndromes, the suites of floral traits that tend to attract a given group of pollinators. They're not cast in stone, but they're pretty good indicators of what an insect would prefer if it was available or what they can yeah. access. So like hummingbirds, red tubular flowers, mm. boy, do they love that, right? You, you know, that's a, that's a go-to. But there are other plants like penstemons, for example. And you know you got some penstemons in Wyoming. There are lots of penstemon species throughout the, uh, the U.S. and North America generally. Um, and so they will go to other colors other flowers that are not red tubular, but you know, it's really good to be thinking about what you can plant for hummingbirds throughout their active season where you are that they prefer. And I, you know, I have my desk positioned so I overlook my backyard, which is it's small, but it's three tiers. Yeah. And I can see the hummingbirds come in and they're really picky. So they'll go to this flower like, yeah, that's not what I want. Over there, they're going to the red. That's, mm. uh, you know, almost always where they're going. And if, and my Minarda denim on my scarlet beetle balm is, you know, no longer in flower. So now they're getting less choosy. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> now they're going yeah. to other things that, you know, Interesting. that have good nectar. So um, bees, um, if you want to support bees, you don't want to be using red flowers. Okay. Because bees really don't see well and they don't see red against green very well. So that's not like a really good choice for bees. Um, and so, you know, color, the shape of the plant, the, um, the shape of the flower, the depth of what we call the corolla tube, where the good stuff is, the nectar, if they're nectar feeders, can really make a difference between, you know, this pollinator and that pollinator can access. If you're a short tongue pollinator, you get to a long corolla tube. And most people at some point in their life have probably seen a delphinium of some sort. They've got like really long corolla tubes. And you're, you're kind of out of luck if you have a short tongue in your pollinator because you can't access that nectar unless you're a smart bee. And sometimes what smart bees will do when they, their tongues aren't long enough is they will nectar rob. They'll bite the base of the flower and steal the nectar. Oh. But it doesn't provide pollination service. Okay. All right. Interesting. Kinda, kinda That's interesting. very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So much good <laughs> stuff. Um. I just realized we, we're running up on time, which just flew by. I have one one more big question before we kind of wrap up. Um, I know some sometimes myself and people in my circle, you know, we know to skip the pesticides at the garden store, the chemical ones. But then when we're dealing with struggles in our vegetable garden, like right now I have cabbage, cab caterpillars, mm. just like crazy. And like they took a whole plant right. completely down. So I'm like, I got to do something. Um, so right. when we're looking for homemade pest repellents or more natural ones like mm -hmm. neem oil or diatomaceous earth, like, are those still problematic? I mean, I, I try to be, if I do use them, I try to be very selective and very careful. Should I avoid them altogether? What, what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, um, first course of action is to get more native plants close to where you're growing vegetables. Okay. Okay. So one, you're trying to increase pollination. Right. So like tomatoes, they'll make their own, their own, you know, they'll, they're self-pollinating. Yep. They don't really need help from a friend, but you get bumblebees in the picture and you get more tomatoes. Right. Mm. So there's that benefit, but there's also the benefit of getting more predatory and a parasitoid, um, you know, uh, natural allies, these wonderful beneficial insects that will help you. I mean, a wasp would love to get a hold of one of those caterpillars. I guarantee you. Okay. There's, okay. there's without a doubt. I, um, just to, to, to give you a, um, kind of a crazy example. So, um, that spotted lanternfly that I mentioned before, one of my students sent me a video of a wasp that had attacked a spotted lanternfly. It was dead on the ground and it ripped its wing off and carried it off. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's, there's a lot of kind of freaky stuff, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but I mean, they, they can be merciless, but you want those allies in your landscape plant for them. And if you're doing vegetables, you're doing fruits, get a lot of native plants okay. close up, you know, so you can kind of achieve that. So I'm an organic practitioner. I don't use pesticides. Um, but I certainly appreciate the fact that not all of us can live that way, especially if we're farming. Mm -hmm. So I, I think um, you're kind of moving in the right direction in terms of choosing narrow spectrum products that treat just the problem. Okay. 
the complication is that a lot of these products are broad spectrum and they just take everybody out. Right. And right. then there's a kind of a misunderstanding that organic means benign. No, mm, yeah. even an organic pesticide can be very, you know, um, lethal or sometimes sublethal to a sensitive creature like a bee. And so this is the problem that we're seeing with like neonicotinoid pesticides. Yeah. If you're using those, stop. We, we don't want systemic pesticides in our landscapes. Um, but, you know, a lot of this stuff is sublethal and just, you know, weakens the health of pollinators to the point mm. they really can't reproduce well, they can't be successful and so on. If you are really interested in um, the farming topic, I would say Rodell Institute yes, yes. and Xerxes Society would be two really good resources to check out to see how maybe you can change your practices to be more ecologically friendly. Okay. I love that. And I love just the idea of, of adding instead of always subtracting. I, I was talking to someone right. a while back. They're like, you know, when you have problems, we always want to kill, subtract, scorch earth. And like, maybe you add in. Right. And that's exactly what you said, which I think is so right. brilliant. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good advice. Thank you for that. I, I'm definitely, nope. I'm on a mission now for more natives. I have some, I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling like ready to go. I'll get a lot more. So um, it's been awesome. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Anything else you'd want to add as we, as we kind of wrap up here that we didn't cover or you want people to know before we sign off? Well, um, I, I think I kind of mentioned this before um, that this is a really fulfilling thing to be doing, right? It really fills our soul at a time that maybe, you know, news is really depressing and tough to take and so on. It's also very community building. Yeah. So I think we need to seek out those opportunities to enrich our lives. And um, I mean, I can just speak personally. My, my life is enriched every day by what I just see out the windows and when I get into my gardens and I can share with others. So I hope everybody will kind of get on the bandwagon and um, let's be good to the planet. It's the only one we have. Yeah. Good advice. A great way to close. And um, just to make sure everybody knows that your book is the Pollinator Victory Garden. Guys, go get it. This is one of those books you need to have on your homestead resource reference shelf. It's worth having. It's so good. Thank you. And can they get it anywhere books are sold, just the usual channels? Anywhere, yeah, you know, your typical, you know, who yep. um, online. But if you've got an independent bookseller near you, yes. show them some love. Go, Times go have been tough guys. for them. So try to try to frink at your independent bookseller if you can. Yeah. Amen to that. All right, Kim. Thank you for this. This was Thank so you fun. So much. It was a pleasure. So Thank informative, you, and I'm feeling inspired. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye bye now. <laughs>